Good morning, I'm Sophia Good morning, I'm Good morning, I'm Yeah, all right. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, now I have to introduce the high table. Yeah, so to my right, uh, we have uh, Dr. George Tukumale, who is representing uh, the sector for health. And then we have Professor Henry Manduba. He is representing Malawi Family Trust and uh, investigators of the study. And we have uh, Rosie Nienda, the director of HIV and AIDS. Online, we have over 40 people. So I uh, would like to give each and everyone the chance to introduce uh, themselves, but uh, looking at the time, uh, we don't have that time. But we have uh, people from their institutions like uh, MOW, UNC, uh, Minister of Wealth, and uh, other uh, organizations, uh, stakeholders. Uh, online, I should also recognize uh, the Director of Public Health Institute of Malawi, uh, Dr. Chilima, uh, as well as the Head of uh, Research uh, in the Ministry of Health, uh, Dr. Collins Bidambo. Yeah, so uh, you are all welcome to this scientific meeting. This is an initiative, uh, the, the Ministry of Health, that uh, should provide uh, a platform where researchers could share their findings, uh, more especially to, with the reason to, to drive the policy change. So today we have a study from MOW uh, that will be presented. But in the future, on the same forum, we're going to see uh, different researchers uh, presenting uh, their, their findings. Ideally, each and every month, this forum will give chance to all the researchers who are working on COVID studies to present uh, their findings monthly. But every three months, the forums will be organized to the follow will be organized to make sure that uh, multidisciplinary uh, research is uh, presented and uh, influence uh, policy. My humble duty this morning is to introduce the program to the members uh, present. Uh, we are going to have welcome remarks from the head of research, uh, Dr. Nitambo, and the uh, copy I, Professor Manduba from MOW, will give his remarks. And then we are going to have official, official opening from the representative of the Secretary for Health, Dr. Simwinga. 
we will present the findings uh, or the study. And then the floor will be handed over to the Department of Asia and the Arts to lead the discussion on what we can learn from this study and how uh, possibly this can influence uh, the policy. And uh, by how can we expect Dr. Mali to close uh, the meeting? So at this point, uh, I would like to ask uh, Dr. Collins Mitambo uh, to give the welcome remarks. Uh, the guest of honor, uh, Dr. Jitope Mali, representing the Secretary for Health. Um, Dr. Mandumba from MRW and all staff from MRW. Uh, Dr. Uh, Rose Nirenda and all directors, deputy directors, and uh, Minister of Health uh, officials. I'd uh, also like to recognize the presence of all representatives uh, from academia, um, from the NGOs, civil society, all researchers, and all protocol observe. Uh, this morning, um, I should thank the guest of honor of saying that I should just say some few remarks. Um, we've seen that uh, the agenda is so short and as such, uh, I'll not spend much time to, uh, to talk about the KTP or to have a lot of way to talk about the ambition because there will be presenters to talk about ambition. But um, uh, the guest of honor, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, I would just like to introduce that uh, the Minister of Health has got the knowledge transition platform. And I would like to really appreciate the MOW for, uh, for getting in touch with the uh, knowledge transition platform of the Minister of Health to ensure that we are disseminating uh, research evidence to the relevant uh, uh, policymakers. Um, one core area which the knowledge transition platform wants is to reduce the gap between researchers and policymakers. As such, we believe that uh, research should be disseminated to the intended, uh, 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 intended uh, stakeholder. Um, you find that uh, uh, we can organize nice dissemination conference, but you find that it's a researcher disseminated to a researcher. And I like this approach whereby MOW has involved the director of HIV to ensure that uh, uh, the research findings are really uh, dealing with the intended uh, uh, beneficially. Um, this, this should be uh, uh, one area which all researchers we should try to ensure that we are targeting the, uh, the intended uh, uh, stakeholders so that we, we change policy. Uh, otherwise, I'd like to thank you, the guest of honor, for, for coming uh, at a short notice. And uh, I wish you a fruitful discussion. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. Yeah, thank you uh, very much, uh, the head of research, Dr. Collins Mitambo. Now, I'd like to call upon Professor Manduba from MOW to give his remarks. Um, thank you, Director of Ceremonies, Dr. Zinkambani Kambalame. And um, I'd also like to um, acknowledge uh, the presence of the um, um, Director of Clinical Services uh, at the Ministry of Health. Uh, Dr. Jitobe Mwale, uh, the presence of uh, Mrs. Rose Nirenda, Director of uh, HIV AIDS at the Ministry of Health as well. Uh, and online, um, Dr. Ben Chilima, Director of uh, FIM, but also Dr. Collins Mitambo, Director of uh, Research. Um, I, I would also like to uh, acknowledge the presence of uh, Mrs. Um, uh, Lin Lee uh, Deputy Director of uh, Queen Elizabeth Central Hospital. Uh, my co-PI, uh, Professor Mina Hosseinipoa, uh, Scientific Director of uh, UNC, but also uh, all colleagues uh, who were involved in the ambition trial, uh, both at UNC, um, Dr. Cecilia Kanyaman Hatim, uh, but also at uh, Queen Elizabeth Center Hospital and MOW, uh, Dr. Melanie Moyo and her team, uh, all media houses uh, present here, uh, but also um, uh, online, and everybody else who's joined in uh, presently here uh, on and online. For me, this is um, a great honor to represent the um, ambition team in Malawi uh, to give these introductory remarks. 
Um, as we all know, uh, this was uh, a two-site trial in Malawi uh, with UNC here in Lilongwe and uh, KCH and uh, uh, MOW in Bland uh, with uh, Queen Elizabeth Center Hospital. We cannot fail to acknowledge uh, the support that uh, government gives the research institutions uh, in order to conduct research that's uh, relevant and meaningful to the people of Malawi. We could not have undertaken uh, this trial without the support of the two central hospitals, uh, which are the main hospitals that look after patients with uh, cryptococcal meningitis. As we all know, um, UNC and MOW are research affiliates uh, of uh, the Kamuzu University of uh, Health Sciences. And really our goal is to conduct research that will improve the health of Malawians, uh, but also um, you know, improve the training of people who are able to do that research. With respect to uh, cryptococcal meningitis, we know it is you know, an illness that kills a lot of HIV infected individuals. And it's an illness that's really exclusive uh, to people who are uh, HIV infected. Although other people with uh, immunosuppression can suffer from it. But we both MOW and uh, UNC um, have invested a lot of time and resources uh, in trying to find solutions uh, to dealing with this problem. It is a complex problem in the sense that treatment uh, is quite complex, but the treatment that is widely available in Malawi fluconazole and also in other low-income countries is suboptimal uh, in terms of improving survival. And people who receive fluconazole alone as a treatment for cryptococcal meningitis, about 55% of them would die by 10 weeks of starting treatment. Now, that is highly uh, unacceptable mortality that we need to do with. But again, a lot of you will be aware of um, uh, the previous uh, clinical trial, the ACTA trial, which we conducted here in Malawi in association with uh, other partners in African countries. And that trial, again, UNC and uh, MOW were involved and did bring about a significant change to the policy uh, of, for treating cryptococcal meningitis. And the results showed that you can reduce the mortality from over 50% to under 30% by you know, uh, introducing a one-week treatment induction period with um, for tericin B. The aim of uh, the ambition trial, uh, as Lusako will elaborate in a moment, was to try and simplify that even further. Can we have a much easier to administer treatment, which probably would be much cheaper to administer in our setting than the currently recommended treatment? And as uh, we'll see in a moment, the trial has shown that, yes, it is possible to do that. So that brings us to the point that having found those results, we need to work with government uh, to try and you know, implement them so that they become the standard of care, at least here in Malawi. And I'm really grateful to the governments of Malawi, I mean, present and past, that they've been really receptive uh, to research outputs from research done in, in this country. If you look at the track record of research we've conducted in Malawi, government has been really receptive uh, and implemented the research findings in many diseases, malaria, HIV. And I think uh, this is something that we should not take for granted because other countries uh, are not able to implement important research findings simply because of um, uh, you know, obstacles uh, at higher level. And therefore, I'm really thankful that the Ministry of Health has been receptive uh, and uh, you know, has agreed to listen to the findings of this trial and work with the researchers and the institutions to see how best we can implement them to benefit uh, the patients uh, with whom we intend to help, but also improve the care of patients with cryptococcal meningitis world over. We hope that uh, these findings will translate into policy in Malawi for treating patients with cryptococcal meningitis, but also go beyond the borders of Malawi. This is a trial that was conducted in five countries. Um, and we hope that the findings will be translated not only in Malawi or Africa, but beyond uh, the borders of Africa. So uh, with those remarks, I'd like to um, uh, thank uh, everybody who is here. 
uh, I would like to thank uh, the institutions uh, that hosted the research affiliates to conduct this uh, research. Uh, and indeed, um, I hope that uh, the discussion will be fruitful and uh, uh, enable us to move this forward uh, into policy. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Prof. Mandumba, uh, for the remarks. Now is uh, the time to have the guest of honor to officially open the meeting, uh, Dr. Mari. Hope you have allow me to look at this. <coughs> Um, maybe before I go to uh, the speech that uh, was prepared for the guest of honor, uh, Dr. Charles Mansambo, let me uh, mention that uh, he really wanted to be here, uh, but because of uh, a meeting that has been uh, called uh, by the office of the vice president, uh, he could not be able to join us and therefore he asked me to represent him uh, at this uh, particular meeting. So I thought I should start on that note. The acting director, Malawi Liverpool Welcome Trust, Prof. Henry Mwandumba, the scientific director, UNC, Prof. Mina, the chair, National Medicines Committee, Dr. Chimota Wachimota Piri, the director H HIV and AIDS in the ministry, Mrs. Rosie Mirenda, the director of FIM, Dr. Ben Chilima, the acting director research, Dr. Collins Mitambo, and all colleagues from the ministry here present, the, ex the executive director, Mehen, Mr. George Jobe, members of the media, ladies and uh, gentlemen, good morning. I would like to join those that have spoken before me to welcome you all to this scientific meeting, whose primary objective is to disseminate the results of a clinical trial looking into the new regimen for the treatment of cryptococcal meningitis. It is always an honor for me to be among his colleagues and professionals from research and other institutions. As you are aware, cryptococcal meningitis causes considerable suffering and deaths among people living with HIV. It is the most common type of adult meningitis in much of Africa and without effective treatment, infection progresses rapidly to death. Globally, there are roughly 230,000 cases of cryptococcal meningitis and about 180,000 people lose their lives to cryptococcal meningitis each year. The majority of whom are from Sub-Saharan Africa. Tackling the high mortality rate remains a big challenge in Africa. The WHO recommends a combination of intravenous amphotericin B and oral fluoxytocin for one week, followed by another week of high dose oral fluconazole as induction therapy for the treatment of Crypto cryptococcal meningitis. We, however, know that despite aphrotericin B not being widely available across Africa, the drug is associated blood counts and it requires <clears throat> prolonged hospitalization, intensive nursing care, and expensive laboratory monitoring, which can be costly for the healthcare system and the patient. Where amphotericin B 
is unavailable or cannot be safely monitored, the alternative WHO recommended treatment is two weeks of fluconazole and flucytosin. Flucytosin is also not widely available in many countries, and this includes malaria. So patients end up being treated with fluconazole alone. The irony is treatment with fluconazole alone is not as effective as amphotericin based regimens. It follows therefore that sustainable, cost-effective and easily administered treatments are urgently required. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to recommend, I would, I would like to commend the Clinical Scientist Trust and University of North Carolina for taking part um, in this research, in the research consortium that has looked into um, this, in the research consortium that looked into the clinical trial. And I must say, they are, the results of uh, this study are coming at the right time when the ministry uh, with its stakeholders through the National Medicines Committee chaired by Dr. Chimota Wachimota Piri is reviewing and updating the Malawi standard treatment guidelines. It is the expectation that the results from this clinical trial will inform policy change in the management of cryptococcal meningitis in Malawi and thus improve patient outcomes. On that note, ladies and gentlemen, it is a privilege for me to declare this meeting on behalf of the SH officially opened. I thank you for your attention. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Mai, representing uh, the sector for health. And uh, from his speech, and also from uh, uh, speech. At this point now, we know what is yet to come from Dr. Siminga. So now the time has come for Dr. Siminga to unveil the groundbreaking, the groundbreaking uh, results of ambition study. You have the floor, Dr. Siminga. Thank you. Good morning, um, ladies and gentlemen. I would like to recognize the presence of all distinguished ladies and gentlemen in, this, in the audience and uh, all those that are, for, are following the discussion, the, the meeting on, uh, on Zoom. Um, allow me to present to you the ambition uh, therapy induction optimization uh, phase three trial that we did uh, um, in um, five different countries in Africa. Uh, this study was carried out in um, eight different hospitals uh, across five countries. And uh, what exactly we were doing, we investigated the single use of a high dose liposomal amphotericin breast treatment in HIV associated cryptococcal meningitis. Just a brief background. Just a brief background. Uh, as it has already been highlighted by the speakers that have come before me, um, HIV associated cryptococcal meningitis is uh, the second leading cause of uh, HIV related mortality. Uh, currently, the treatment of uh, cryptococcal meningitis remains the use of amphotericin B. Uh, just to mention a few, um, 
And for choicing B, I, uh, I quiz as um, uh, uh, toxicities, uh, for example, renal impairment, and uh, patients do also have uh, increased tendencies to have um, knowledge with um, electrolyte imbalances when they are on this treatment. As Prof. Man uh, Mandumba has already stated, there was previously a trial that was carried out here in Malawi, which is called the, which is called the Advanced Cryptococcal Treatment uh, in, in Africa, uh, abbreviated to ACTA. This trial demonstrated that a seven-day course of uh, amphotericin B can be given together with fusitocin. And uh, it was noted that this, uh, this, uh, this, 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 course of, this course of treatment is non-inferior to a 14-day course of uh, amphotericin B alone. Uh, however, uh, like some, uh, uh, as we have already said that amphotericin B is related to a lot of uh, drug-related toxicities, it is with this background in mind that we looked at liposomal amphotericin, which we abbreviate to ambisom, uh, which, we, which is known to be less toxic and has a long half-life and it effectively penetrates the central nervous system to get to the cryptococcus, which is the causative agent for the cryptococcal meningitis. Um, our research group had previously done a phase two study which uh, demonstrated that a single dose of um, uh, ambisom that is at 10 milligrams per kg was non inferior to the study at clearing cryptococcus from the cerebrospinal fluid, and uh, it was also found to be well tolerated. Uh, with, uh, with the background that we've discussed, uh, we therefore sought to evaluate the whether we wanted to know whether the use of uh, a single high dose ambisom um, that is at 10 milligrams per kg coupled with um, flucytosin administered at 100 milligrams per kg per day for 14 days and a high dose fluconazole of 1,200 milligrams per day for 14 days. We wanted to see if this was, we wanted to see if this was uh, non inferior to the control, which is the standard uh, WHO recommended dose for, um, sorry, the regimen for the treatment of cryptococcal meningitis, uh, especially in resource limited settings like Malawi. So the standard recommended WHO um, treatment for cryptococcal meningitis is uh, the administration of amphotericin B at the dose of one milligram per kg for seven days with procytosine at 100 milligrams per kg per day for seven days, after which fluconazole is given at 1,200 milligrams per, per day for seven days. So this two week uh, course is, uh, is, the, is called the induction phase, after which um, there is uh, a maintainers, uh, the maintainers doses of uh, fluconazole which is given. So uh, with this, uh, for this study, we wanted to look at the primary outcome, which was the all cause mortality at 10 weeks. And uh, we also had a list of uh, secondary outcomes, which included the safety of the use of the ambisome, the, um, the early fungicidal activity, and also the all-cause mortality at two, four, and 16 weeks. Uh, so we are going to look at the highlighted, the, the highlighted points. We will look at the primary outcomes and the secondary outcomes for, uh, for both these two arms. So for our study, we recruited uh, participants. We recruited adult participants who had the first episode of cryptococcal meningitis, which was laboratory confirmed uh, either by Indian ink or cryptococcal antigen. And we also, saw, we also sought to include only those patients and only those participants that were HIV positive. So for our exclusion criteria, uh, our exclusion criteria included, um, uh, it excluded those patients that had uh, uh, previous serious uh, reactions to any of the study drugs. Uh, in this case, uh, the ambisome, uh, the amphotericin B, the fluconazole, or the fusitosine. And also, all, all, the, all the participants that were HIV negative, if they had the cryptococcal meningitis, but they were HIV negative, we excluded those uh, participants from our study. 
we also um, had a lead exclusion criteria, which started, which um, helped us to include to start patients that were critical and well in the study. Um, while we wait, while, uh, while we waited for the baseline, um, the baseline uh, uh, blood results. So, if patients, if a patient was included, uh, met the inclusion criteria for the study, was uh, enrolled into the into the study. However, if they met the lead exclusion uh, criteria, we 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 had to remove them from the study. We had to exclude them from the study. So, as I already said, uh, we had um, we had eight study sites a total of eight study sites across five different countries. In Malawi, we had uh, we, we were enrolling our patients from Kamuzu Central Hospital, and uh, the study team was from UNC Project. And in Blantyre, we also had um, a study team from uh, M, uh, Malawi Welcome Trust enrolling patients um, participants from Queen Elizabeth Central Hospital. Um, so, how we carried out our study, all patients were screened and uh, we, we, they were assessed for eligibility to be, to be included in the study. Uh, if they met the eligibility uh, criteria, they would be consented and um, randomized into the two different arms. So we aimed to, uh, the, the randomization of similar number of patients in the ambisome arm and the control arm. So, um, as I already said, the patients, um, the participants would be uh, given an induction phase of treatment for two weeks. Uh, and then afterwards, they would be followed up for eight weeks. And uh, in that eight weeks, they would be given a fluconazole of uh, 800 milligrams per day. And uh, thereafter, they would be given uh, 200 milligrams of flu uh, fluconazole. So at uh, four to six weeks after initiation of uh, antifungal therapy, uh, if uh, the patients would be either initiated on ART, re, um, reinitiated if the ART was stopped or switched uh, if, they, if, they, if uh, the, the regimen for the AR, uh, ART needed to be changed. Uh, so the primary outcome uh, were, was assessed at um, 10 weeks. Um, we managed to assess 1,193 patients, uh, participants in, uh, in our study. Um, following the inclusion and exclusion criteria, we randomized 844 uh, participants, 421 into the arm and 423 into the control arm. Uh, after the lead, uh, after uh, after the uh, after the lead exclu uh, exclusion criteria, um, uh, 407 patients were, were left in the intention to treat arm, and uh, both in the ambisome arm and the control arm, and uh, 388 patients were in the were in were treated as per protocol, and 396 were treated as per protocol in the. Um, in the control arm and 288 in the ambisome arm. I'm just going to take you through the baseline characteristics of our, um, of our study participants. So of note, I would like to draw your attention to the, to, the, to the fact that most of our participants were males. In the ambisome arm, we had about 60% of, uh, of participants being male and uh, same with the control arm. The median age for our participants was uh, 37 years in, uh, in both arms. And uh, most of our participants were ART experienced. That is to say, they had ever been on ART or they, they were on ART as, at, at the time of um, um, enrollment. Uh, looking at the level of consciousness of uh, our patient as a baseline characteristic, uh, we see that uh, they, 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 they had a similar uh, presentation. So the, the level of consciousness was similar in uh, both arms for the ambisome and the control arm. Uh, looking at the median CSF fungal count, uh, that is uh, the amount of, uh, uh, of cryptococcus in the CSF per, per meal, CSF is the level of spinal fluid. It was, uh, it was also uh, almost the same in both arms. Uh, now here we present the primary outcome data. 
um, at 10 weeks of post mortality in the ambisome arm, we see that 101 patients had, uh, uh, we, we had a total number of 101 deaths in the ambisome arm, which represents a mortality rate of 24.8%. And in the control arm, we had a mortality rate of 28.7%. The risk difference um, in the mortality rate was negative 3.93%. Uh, with a 90% confidence interval of uh, negative 9.0 to 1.2. Um, we had a pre-specified 10% non-inferiority margin of 10%, of, of 10 so looking at the upper bound of the 90% confidence interval of the risk difference in the intention to treat non-adjusted -ad analysis, we see that it was way below the pre-specified 10% non-inferiority margin. And when we look at the per protocol, um, uh, when we look at the per protocol analysis, we see that the, in the ambisome arm, the mortality rate at 10, at, uh, 10 weeks was 24.5%. And in the control arm, the mortality rate was 28.5% with the risk difference of uh, negative 4.05%. Of note, uh, what I would like to draw attention to is that um, this uh, the 90 the upper bound of 90% confidence interval, which is 1.1, was also well below the 10% uh, pre-specified non-inferiority margin. If we look at the 95% confidence interval for both the intention to treat and uh, the per protocol analysis for the unadjusted uh, data, we see that uh, the upper bound of the 95% confidence interval was also well below the 10% pre-specified non-inferiority margin. Uh, we see that the data for the uh, all-cause mortality at 10 weeks for the adjusted data, we see that the risk differences in the intention to treat and in the per protocol, we see that the upper bound of the confidence intervals is also well below the pre-specified um, 10 percent non-inferiority margin, which is to say that uh, the ambisome arm was non-inferior to the control arm. This is just uh, this is the representation of uh, the 90 percent confidence interval uh, data or for the intention to treat population for protocol population both in the adjusted and non-adjusted. Uh, looking at the dotted line, which is the inferiority, if we specified inferiority margin of 10%, we see that uh, in across all analysis, the upper bound of the 90% confidence interval is, is well below the pre-specified margin of 10% uh, non-inferiority margin. This, uh, this graph, uh, is showing the survival curves for the the data the, the the patients in the in the in the arms in the two arms the uh, control arm and the ambisome arm. Uh, of note is that uh, the the red solid line represents the 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 the, the amphotericin B arm, and the blue dotted line represents the ambisome arm. And what we see is that. Uh, the x-axis is representing the time since randomization. And we see that uh, for most of the duration, uh, the all-cause mortality was greater in the amphotericin B arm compared to the lipos uh, liposomal amphotericin B and this one. Now, uh, moving on to the secondary outcomes. Uh, here, we present the all-cause mortality at two, four, and 16 weeks. Uh, this is the intention to treat an adjusted analysis. Uh, so uh, of note is that the risk differences in the uh, mortality, uh, mortality at, at two, four, and six weeks, we see that at two, at two weeks, the risk difference is 0.49%. At four weeks, the risk difference is negative 1.47%. And uh, at 16 weeks, the risk difference is uh, negative 0.98%. To 
just to briefly uh, explain uh, what all this means, we are, we are looking at the 90% confidence interval of the risk differences, which we see that in all, uh, in all, in all the data presentation at two, four, two, four and 16 weeks, we see that the upper bound of the 90% confidence interval is still well below the pre-specified margin of uh, non-inferiority at 10%. Now, this uh, data representation is showing us the early fungicidal activity. So uh, this is uh, just the rate of uh, clearance of cryptococcus from the cerebral spinal fluid. Uh, this, uh, so in the ambisome arm, those were the patients that were, the, that were given the uh, liposomal amphotericin and the control arm is a, that, that's, the, that's for the patients that, that were given the, that were given the uh, Alphotericin B. So uh, we see that there was no uh, uh, there was no um, significant uh, differences in the early fungicidal activity because we see that in uh, the ambisome arm, uh, the EFA, the early fungicidal activity, was a negative 0 0.40 log minus 10 colon colony forming units per mil per day. In the, in the in the that's in the ambisome arm and uh, in the control arm we see that uh, the EFA was negative 0 0.42 which which shows that there is no uh, statistically significant uh, difference. Um, because because our patients were given uh, were given uh, drugs, we needed to look at the at the uh, we needed to analyze the the safety of the population. So we looked at the adverse events that, ha that had happened in, uh, in the patients in both the ambisome and the control arm. Uh, so adverse events are, sim are simply unexpected uh, medical occurrences that happen uh, in the course of treatment. Uh, looking at the total number of uh, adverse events. So we looked at, uh, we, we, we had a scale for, uh, we had a scale for um, characterizing our, 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 the adverse events. So grade, we had the grade one, grade two, grade three, up to grade four. Grade three and grade four are simply like more severe forms of the adverse events. So looking at the total number of uh, uh, grade three or grade four adverse events that had happened, we see that uh, adverse events were more, were, were more frequent in the control arm than the ambisome arm. In the control arm, we had, um, we had, yeah, in the, yeah, in the control arm, we had more, we had uh, frequently occurring grade three, grade four adverse events compared to the ambisome arm. Now breaking down the adverse events um, into the group of anemia, uh, looking at the patients that, uh, the number of uh, patients that developed grade three or grade four anemia, we see that in the ambisome arm, uh, we had a total of 13% uh, of our participants developing an, a grade three, grade four anemia. And in the control arm, we had 41%. Uh, as you can see, anemia was, or, or had occurred more in the control arm compared to the ambisome arm. And uh, looking at the mean change in hemoglobin level uh, from uh, day one, from day of enrollment to day seven, we see that there was um, more drop in hemoglobin in the control arm, which is at negative 1.9, uh, compared to negative 0 0.3 in the ambisome arm. And uh, looking at patients that, the total number of uh, patients that uh, participants that required transfusion, we see that in the control arm, we had a higher uh, percentage of participants uh, requiring transfusion compared to the ambisome. In the control arm, we had a total of 18% of participants requiring uh, blood transfusion compared to 8% of participants in the ambisome arm requiring transfusion. Uh, looking at the uh, occurrence of, um, of renal toxicity, uh, which was measured by the level of creatinine increase, uh, we see that uh, there was no significant difference in the ambisome and the control arm. In the ambisome arm, we had uh, a total of 5% uh, of, of participants that had developed grade three, grade four, uh, 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 create an increase, and uh, in the control arm we had six percent. Uh, however, we had um, a higher percentage of participants in the control arm 
uh, who had a, a, a higher percentage change in treatment compared, compared to day one and day seven. In the control arm, we had 49.7%, and in the ambisome arm, we had 20.2%. And uh, patients that had developed hypokalemia, which is a uh, reduced uh, potassium level in the blood, uh, we see which can also be a, a complication of, um, of uh, uh, amphotericin administration. We see that in the control arm, more patients had developed hypokalemia, uh, which is at, uh, compared to the ambisome arm. Uh, the, other, the, the other adverse events that we looked at was the uh, uh, thrombophlebitis requiring antibiotics. Thrombophlebitis is simply um, infection at the, at, the, in, uh, at the intravenous drug administration site. Uh, so in this case, we are looking at uh, uh, that kind of infection, only those kind of infections that required um, antibiotics. We see that in the control arm, we had a total. We had a in the control arm. We had a total of seven seven percent of patients requiring antibiotics for the for for thrombophlebitis that had happened that had occurred compared to two percent of participants in uh, the ambisom arm. Now, lastly, we are going to look at uh, uh, the occurrence of neutropenia, which is a uh, reduced um, reduced uh, neutrophil count. Uh, that is the marker of uh, it can be simple in simple terms. It can be it can be said to be uh, reduced immunity. So uh, patient, uh, and thrombocytopenia that's reduced plate, uh, platelets and elevated alanine transaminase, which is just a marker of uh, of uh, liver injury. We see that uh, there was a low. Uh, there was not. Uh, there was not a. Uh, there, was, there was. There wasn't a significant. Um, there was. There wasn't a significant frequency of neutropenia, thrombocytopenia, and uh, liver insult in both arms, uh, in both arms, the ambisome and the control. So uh, all the things that we have been discussing here, uh, to wrap it all up, uh, we would like you to take home the message that um, the, in, this, in this trial that we had, um, this was the largest cryptococcal meningitis trial that has, that has been conducted to date. And it has demonstrated that a single high dose ambisome given with flucytosine and fluconazole was non inferior to the current WHO recommended uh, regimen, uh, which is uh, amphotericin B uh, plus flucytosine and uh, fluconazole. If this was uh, the, the ambisome was found to be, uh, sorry, the single high dose ambisome regimen was found to be non inferior to the current WHO recommended standard care of HIV associated HIV um, cryptococcal meningitis. Um, the ambisome, however, the, since the, uh, the amphotericin B is, uh, is, uh, is associated with uh, increased uh, levels of uh, drug to toxicity, uh, they say that the ambisome regimen, which has significant reduction in adverse events as has been presented from the previous slide. And it also, it, it also shows that uh, patients, they, they have reduced need for blood transfusion, and they have uh, also a significantly smaller increase in, uh, in, in creatinine. Uh, this is just drawing your attention to the reduced level of, uh, the, the reduced occurrence of adverse events in the ambisome arm compared to the, the control arm, which is the amphotericin B. Uh, for this reason, this regimen offers a practical, uh, easier to use, and, uh, it, and it, it is also better tolerated uh, in the treatment of HIV associated uh, with cryptococcal meningitis in Africa. Uh, therefore, for this reason, uh, we would like to, to draw attention to the need to implement uh, this uh, ambisome, ambisome regimen. Uh, and also we would like to, to uh, emphasize on the urgent need to broaden access uh, of, health, of health facilities to the to ambisome and the flucytosine because it has been uh, it has been um, uh, it, it has been we, we have managed to uh, bring up that point that ambisome and the flucytosine uh, uh, regimen in the treatment of uh, meningitis uh, is uh, is superior 
to the control, the, the control, sorry, it is superior to the standard treatment, which uses uh, amphotericin B and uh, fluoxetine plus fluconazole. Last but not least, we would like to extend a huge amount of gratitude to all our participants and uh, the caregivers who, uh, who took part in this study. And uh, also, I would like to um, recommend, we would like to recommend the, the massive contribution or the massive contribution of the team that was involved in, uh, in this study and make sure that we had a successful study uh, of uh, ambition uh, phase three trial. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you. Uh, so at this point, well, we, we are going to take questions, but they are going to be taken by the by the PI and the rest of the ambition team. Another round of course. Yeah, so this is science, right? Uh, or this is too technical, the participants. Yeah, Lusa, when you're presenting, um, the results are wonderful. Yeah, but what I wanted to know from the rest of the participants is whether we are able to grasp, to grasp the gist, the findings. All in all, what it means is that the landscape is changing and uh, the findings were actually, if we have the hypothesis, right? I think they have the hypothesis that maybe uh, this intervention is not inferior uh, to the standard treatment, which is uh, which performs poor in terms of uh, safety, uh, adverse events, and, and the like. So they have confirmed their findings that this cheaper and a safer treatment is not inferior. This is uh, what Lucio was trying to communicate. Yeah, so as a scientific meeting, it is uh, allowed to present it the way it is, and it's supposed to be as technical as it is. And uh, when you find it interesting, then it means uh, more palatable tools can be developed in terms of policy brief, uh, which are translated uh, in a language that can be understood by um, the lay people. Yeah, but I think uh, the results were very much clear and uh, the presentation was uh, very simple. So without much ado here, I would like to ask the members present both online and physically to ask questions and also we're going to have a discussion uh, regarding how this can inform uh, or influence the policy. And I'll hand over the floor uh, to Dr. Wilson Matora and the RSP. Uh, Dr. Wilson is from HIV and AIDS uh, department and uh, Eras is from uh, MOW. So they're going to lead uh, the question and answers as, and, and the discussion uh, session. Let's feel free to contribute. Yeah, because um, as you have seen, this was a much study. It happened in five uh, different countries. And in Malawi, we were lucky that we had the Alilongwa de Planta represented. Yeah, so we have to own the results and the contribute to this discussion. And subsequently, I know uh, there will be some scientific publications as well as um, the tools that will be used to inform uh, policy discussions. 
Uh, Dr. Matola, uh, come forward and Elias, and then you lead uh, the question and answers as well as discussion. And uh, your time is limited because uh, you only have 50 minutes to do this.
But you are also not neglected to know about the source of what you are thinking, as well as the side dishes or the other dishes that you see in the situation that is not there. So that is the more advantageous to use the knowledge and the source compared to the body that you need to go to the center. Sorry, I got that question. So, uh, there are a few questions from your line, too, but they can just go to the side. Can you mind the report of your side? Can I? I will respond to a few questions which I picked. Um, you asked about how long was the study? Uh, the study was for four years, but that doesn't mean that we are, we, are, we are like observing the patient for four years, no. The actual study was for four years, but for the patient, for the patient is only for 16 weeks. So if the patient is on all today, we are observing the patient for 16 weeks. 
So the patient would be in the ward up for seven days, then go discharge. Then the patient was put into the clinics uh, like an OPD patient. So that was how long that was. The other one was about observation of the AEs, the adverse events. So on the adverse events, it was like there and then. For example, if the patient had anemia, we are treating the anemia, and the patient was getting better and fine there and then. That was across all the all the AEs. There was nothing like taking long time. It was just there and then. The other one is, was like, are uh, the results the same with other countries? In fact, what we're talking here, we're talking about all the countries. It's not only for Malawi. Like for Malawi, we had, like for UNC, we had 110 uh, patients. Blanta around 210. So, but what we're talking about here, I think it's for the whole, the whole site. The other question which I picked was about the standard treatment to be recommended in uh, for other patients. Fortunately enough, all the patients we had in the study, they are, they are out, they are gone. So there's nothing like somebody, a certain patient is still in the, in the ward. It's different from the other studies, which like HIV AIDS, maybe a patient is getting like this regimen, then another, a new regimen comes, then we switch maybe the other one to a new one. But with, the, with this study, our patients were in the ward for maybe seven days. They were getting better and they're going home. So this question is not, uh, the, the, way it, the way you asked, it's not the same as for our patients. I think this is what I had. I don't know if Prof. Odumbo has anything to add. Yeah. Or maybe as they're coming forward, there was one question online. Um, there was one question online from Lakengwira. It said, very interesting results from the clinical trial perspective. My question to Prof. Mandumba is regarding the cost effectiveness, which is another important driver for policy. Are you able to share these findings at this point? So maybe Prof. Mandumba, you can take that before the next question. Thank you, Lucky. Uh, that's, that's a very important question. I think if we are going to persuade the government, the Minister of Health, and uh, uh, with the findings from this trial, we have to demonstrate that it's cheaper, it's safer to use than the currently recommended regimen. And I think that applies to um, uh, its implementation, even at international level through WHO recommendations, for example. So a cost-effective study was uh, a component of this trial um, and it's going on in, in Blanta. I think it's finished now, but um, the analysis uh, is not complete yet. And I think you are doing it in, in Ilongo as well. So um, the, the findings of that cost, effective, cost effectiveness uh, study should be available um, fairly soon, but we are confident that, um, you know, it should support the scientific findings that uh, not only is this regimen better from the clinical perspective, but also from the scientific, scientific perspective, but it will also show that it will be cheaper for the service providers. And in this case, uh, the government, because um, the need for monitoring, for example, of patients will be much less. Uh, the duration of hospital stay will be much less. Um, and obviously if you cut out a lot of these um, side effects of uh, the current regimen, then patients are going to get better quicker they're going to stay in hospital much less, and that all translates into less cost uh, for the service providers. So we're confident that this is going to, uh, to be cost effective in the long run. But while I'm here, I think the critical thing for what this trial has brought out is uh, what are the key drugs that we need to have in this country to improve the outcome of our cryptococcal meningitis patients? 
And I think it's clear that uh, amphotericin B, and in this case, ambisome, just as high single dose can make a huge difference to the survival of the patients, but that is critical in combination with the other drug, fluocytosin, which we don't read, readily have in the country. And I think as part of this discussion, or at least as we're going forward discussing with uh, uh, you know, policymakers, we we'll probably need to engage the uh, pharmacy uh, medicines and regulatory authority to see how we can facilitate the availability of these key, key drugs, either liposome amphotericin B or standard amphotericin B, but certainly uh, flucytosin, because this is the key partner drug. We have lots of fluconazole uh, already in the country, so we are quite good at that. But it's the critical induction phase of this treatment that we need to address, get right, because that's got a, a huge impact on the outcomes of the patient's long run. Thank you. Thanks, Prof. Mandumba. And then we can get the next physical question. Uh, thank you, Prof. For the wonderful uh, study results. Uh, my name is Edwin Chipara. I'm coming from the pharmacy and medicines uh, uh, regulatory authority. I have a few questions. Uh, the first one being, uh, I'm interested to, to know the uh, sensitivity of the study, to say uh, what was the study uh, power, especially for the uh, primary outcome. And then uh, the second question is, uh, I noted that uh, for the secondary uh, outcome, um, the results of the uh, uh, for the study group were statistically significant. Uh, how much statistically significant um, uh, than the uh, than the control arm? But then, uh, when we look at the primary outcome, uh, we see that uh, uh, there is an inferiority uh, with respect to uh, all rate um, mortality. So I just wanted to maybe have, I just wanted you maybe to uh, shed more light, uh, provide discussion as to why do we find that uh, between these two arms for the adverse events and most of them being as severe, we find that uh, the one this uh, the one which is using uh, uh, for tracing uh, whatsoever is far much uh, safe than the one, uh, than the standard, uh, than, the stand than, the, than the control group. While at the same time, we find that uh, with respect to the uh, mortality rate, uh, the results are, are comparable. Uh, the third question, I think, is, is similar to what uh, the previous uh, uh, participant uh, raised, is with respect to the, uh, the poll results. Uh, I think uh, it was mentioned that uh, these results are old results from the uh, eight, eight centers. But I think the background to the question was that uh, we have like an old uh, study results whereby uh, we also appreciate to say what were the results uh, like from uh, UNC and uh, Malawi Liverpool uh, Ocam Trust. And then uh, the other question is on the, the actual medicines uh, which were used, like the brands. Did the study use uh, the same brands uh, from start to finish? And uh, was it the same brands across the, uh, the eight centers? I think that may also have uh, uh, some implications on the, on the study uh, results. And lastly, uh, was on the, um, adverse events. Uh, it was mentioned that I think the uh, participants were followed for, is it 16 weeks, uh, if I got it uh, correctly. Uh, but then uh, I just wanted to see if uh, they are also monitored for any uh, adverse events or for long-term uh, side effects. Anything maybe that may emerge uh, uh, in, in the long term, in the long term, uh, which you may not have been able uh, 
to to pick uh, during the um, the course of the, the study. Uh, thank you very much. All right. Uh, thank you very much for uh, those questions. Yeah. Before uh, I pass over to the uh, PIs to respond, yeah. Let me uh, just inform uh, the grouping that uh, as ministry, we are uh, happy to inform you that uh, liposoma for SMB and fluoxetine has been available in the country since January of 2020. Currently, uh, all central hospitals, all district hospitals, all charm and uh, community hospitals, they do stock these uh, medicines and we are giving them to our patients. All right. Uh, can we, uh, yes, we will recognize you. Can we uh, have maybe uh, responses to uh, these questions before we take another set? Thank you. <clears throat> Yeah, thank you. I, I can start by responding to what I got, but um, the first two questions, I didn't get them quite right. So I don't know if it's possible that we can project the slides that he wanted while I'm answering the other questions. Uh, I, I think it's the Kaplan Meyer too, perhaps. So we can project the, that one, the mortality curve. So yeah, this were uh, food results in, in fact, yes, uh, yeah. And we do not have separate analysis for UNC and the Malawi Liverpool at the moment. We can do that, but it will reduce the significance uh, because of the numbers are less. I can say 110 here and 230 or something from Malawi Liverpool. So, the concept of pooling is to increase the significance of the results. But out of interest to see what we had per site, we can do that, but we don't have that information at, at present. In terms of, uh, yeah, I think that's fine. In terms of grants, it was uh, donated through Gilead. So all the sites were using the same blend of uh, Ambisom and Fotericin. Cytosine. Uh, I will have to ask the HIV unit uh, to, tell, to say what blend they are using, but for the study, that's what we, we used. Uh, Long-term side effects. As, uh, we, as uh, uh, Chimem already mentioned, the patients were in the ward seven days minimum. They could go to, four, to 14 days or however long it required for them to get well. So we'd observe the adverse effects. Uh, ad adverse effects then. But the adverse effect you are seeing here goes up to 16 weeks of trial. The patients were at home, but we are still following them up by phone interviews towards the end of the trial. They would come every two weeks for 10 weeks and then we we'll follow up with phone interviews. So it's, it's again results up to 16 weeks. And uh, most of the drugs, if you want to look at the effects, you, sh you should see that by then. The rest is just a mortality difference. Um, the, the other questions, um, just try to adjust. Just one minute. I don't know if you were asking about the mortality to this couple in the I didn't have the question, so I... Do you want to clarify the question again? Yeah. So, and the second one the uh, study. So, in that book, this uh, was the uh, the two arms uh, were the right? mm -hmm. But my interest was only the study. So, uh, how do the study uh, after this? Uh, 
And then they get the conclusion of uh, are based on that graph. You see that the results are the part of the But my question was I, I, I found it, uh, it is surprising to get that uh, with the third uh, round graphs, especially for the for the CV and this things. You see that um, the study now is uh, in terms of safety, is far much, far much better uh, than this condition. Mm -hmm. Yes. If you look at the big body, you can see that it's, it's, it's far much safer. Yes. Now the question is what would be expected? That uh, even in terms of the primary uh, uh, outcomes, the same question is far much safer than the severe consequences. We expect that even the primary outcomes, the primary outcomes with the uh, modality, yes. Uh, it also has to be far much uh, higher than the But you mm -hmm. see that it's comparable in terms of the very and in terms of uh, safety, we find that uh, the study outcome is uh, far much better. Yes. Yes. This is the largest expense, which some of them that they think is only even through the largest expense, which is the wrong population or even the women. So I just wanted to have like this discussion on the around that. Mm -hmm. Yes. 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 Right, so you are right. In terms of adverse events, we see less with the ambition compared to the control. But if you look at the Kaplan Meyer survival caves, they are almost the same, and uh, the difference is not significant there. So the side effects were actually maybe if you look in a study setting, the side effects are managed much better. So you would recognize them and treat them. So they may not have contributed much to the mortality of the patients. But if you look at a routine setting where maybe the, um, uh, the management may not be as intensive as in a trial setting, maybe you can see that it can carry uh, a, a, significant, uh, a significant event on the patient in terms of outcome or, or mortality. So you see most like hypokalemia would collect it right then. Anemia would transfuse, but in a setting where you are not doing it, definitely you would see maybe a difference because of that in terms of mortality. But in terms of more overall mortality of the patients, the trial was just powered to check for non-inferiority. So that's, you, that's the uh, hallmark here. Uh, in terms of statistics, then I would have to look back to you and come back to you how the um, how we came up with the numbers. Uh, but in terms of significance, we were using the p-values, 90% confidence in intervals that we have presented in the slides. But for the actual numbers to come up with, we have that. I don't have the information with me right now. Thank you. I think at this point we'll have to take um, some questions online. So we have questions from Jen Kaonga, uh, which reads, good morning you all, which other countries participated in the study? What was the cost? Another one is, what is the immediate reaction of the Ministry of Health? And then the other one is asking, how available are those drugs locally that are, that are proven to be effective? And then the last one is, were the results of the study, study group similar in all five countries? So I don't know who will be the first to take that. Uh, 
application. So like maybe you should can give me one by one then can give that to me. The first one is which other countries participated in the study and what was the cost? Um, I will answer on the which other countries participated in the study. We had uh, Malawi. In Malawi, we had uh, Blanta and Lirongwe. We also had Zimbabwe. We also had South Africa, Botswana, um, Uganda. These were the countries which we were participating. In other countries, we had two sites, like South Africa had two sites, Uganda we had the two, two, two sites as well. What would the cost? I don't know what, what exactly is trying to say about the cost. Yeah, for, for the cost, remember it's not only the drug you're talking about, it includes also hospitalization, treatment, monitoring of side effects. So as, as Prof Mandumba already answered, we have a cost effective, effectiveness study going on. So we are going to be able to answer that question um, maybe in the next few months for you. Before you go. Um, there are other questions before I call the ministry people to answer the question. Let's see. The other question to you, the investigators, is where the results of the study group similar in all five countries yeah again this is a pooled analysis so uh, until we get the individual uh, analysis per country then we can be able to share but i have also already alluded to the necessity of having pooled analysis in such big trials to make a significant impact on the results you're presenting so if we talk of uh, the long run planter, uh, when we are discussing, we are finding similar uh, events in terms of side effects, in terms of modality. But again, we would have to go into details into that at a later stage. Thanks. Okay. Um, I don't know who this question can be answered by, or who can answer this question. How available are those drugs locally? that have proven to be effective. So maybe because the Minister of Health is already here, I can also read out the other question. What is the immediate reaction of the Minister of Health? Uh, thank you very much for those questions. Let me mention that uh, uh, if you're listening to the presentation, the after findings of the initial study of, initial, of uh, the initial study which was done earlier on, uh, I think in the past few years, uh, in our last care and treatment guidelines, we had already adopted use of uh, liposoma for terrestrial and even for cytosine. Now, uh, this study uh, has also proved, proven that uh, uh, the same drugs are, are, are key in the treatment of meningitis. I think what we are going to do now is just to change our guidelines to fit into the regimen that has been demonstrated uh, in this study. So the drugs are already available. We have been procuring them, them through Global Fund. Uh, we were already using the drugs using the previous findings. So now we are just going to change uh, the regimen guided by the findings from this study. Thank you very much. I hope. Um, I hope I've, I've responded. Maybe just also to add that these findings have come at a right or opportune time because we are revising our treatment, our treatment guidelines. We usually revise them every, every two years. And we are due to revision because there have been a lot of imaging uh, scientific evidence, both locally and uh, globally, that is going to influence the way we manage our patients. So we are already at the point of revising. We are finalizing and uh, these results were shared recently uh, before even this dissemination. We had a discussion with the scientists who, uh, uh, who shared the results and uh, uh, what is remaining is also just to um, share the final document to our technical working group to endorse the changes that we are making to the, um, um, to the guidelines. 
And we are also at a point whereby we are we are moving towards um, refreshing our service uh, service providers. So um, at the moment we are ready to roll out uh, these changes. Thank you. All right, now uh, we'll be uh, taking the last uh, set of questions. And uh, uh, let me invite uh, the Deputy Director of uh, Queen Elizabeth Central Hospital to ask her questions. Yeah, I think that mic is not uh, connected to the system. So online uh, followers are not able to hear from that point. That's why we recommend that. <clears throat> I have a few questions, but most of them have already been uh, answered. My first question is on the, if there was any uh, correlation between CD4 count, uh, LRT compliance and the, the outcomes, uh, uh, even before the admission and after uh, the 10 weeks of follow-up, maybe if the LRT compliance contributed to the outcomes like they did. And I just want to know if the, there were cases of readmissions uh, in both arms and which arm had more readmissions with severe disease after the 10 weeks or during the 10 weeks of follow-up. Uh, another one was on the availability of uh, for terrorism B, but that one has been answered. I'm told that the uh, global fund is buying. So I just wanted to find out if the uh, central medical stores can also stock uh, the medication so that it is readily available to the hospitals. I think those are the questions that I had. Some of them have been answered already. All right, uh, thank you, Madam, for those questions. May I invite the PIs to take the questions? Yeah, yeah thanks very much for the question. So, the question on CD4 count, ART compliance adherence, and the outcome before 10 weeks, there's no difference. This I'm basing on also previous studies that we've done, the one which was mentioned after we have a publication looking at that particular component, and there was no difference at all. Mind you, these are patients, even if they're on ART, it means they're failing the regimen or they were not taking, or they just recently started. So you would look at that, all of them are in the same category in terms of uh, CD4s. So the outcome will not be different, whether they were compliant before or not. Uh, almost half of the patients, we, we, we were stopping the ARTs because they would be patients who just initiated or you would clearly know they are failing, and then they initiated four to six, four to six weeks later. But at ten weeks, mortality didn't matter uh, on on how long the patient were on ART or how compliant. The readmissions we had readmissions, and we are the same. Remember, this is also a, a very sick population, so the other readmissions would be not for meningitis but they would come maybe for sepsis. Maybe it's a TB uh, infection, which is coming now on board or other problems. So there are very few readmissions to clearly say this is a relapse. Actually, when you can remember how many from our study out of 110, maybe one or two, very few, one or two out of 110 would say relapse uh, meningitis, but the rest readmission would be like, you would readmit a patient with a low immunity, HIV. For the drugs, I think I'll leave it to the HIV. 
um, yeah, uh, regarding uh, the central medical stores uh, supplying uh, these medicines to the hospitals, yeah, since most of the patients that will need uh, these medicines are HIV uh, infected, yeah, and the Global Fund is already taking care of the HIV infected people. Yeah, currently uh, it's through uh, the HIV program that uh, the Global Fund is procuring uh, these medicines. Yeah, I don't see, I don't think that uh, there's a need for a CMST to be procuring the same because uh, uh, the Global Fund is procuring enough quantities. As I speak, we're even at risk of uh, having expiries, especially for fluoxetine. It's a slow moving drug. So uh, I don't think there is need for CMST to be procuring. Uh, have I uh, answered this, your question on the orange? Okay. All right, then uh, moving forward. Yes, sir. There's uh, uh, one hand. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I, I, I just uh, probably as the uh, we are looking at uh, moving forward, uh, would also want to uh, make a recommendation that uh, you also have like a meeting uh, to, to share in detail with the, the pharmacy and medicines regulatory authority, because uh, one of uh, um, the action points or uh, requests that were made by the uh, presenter was that uh, uh, the new legislation, at least the pharmacy and medicines regulatory authority, should consider procuring. And um, we saw PMRA uh, asking some questions here. So I would think that would be the way. And uh, also recommending to the ministry, Minister for Health. Uh, that uh, after clinical trials where medicines are involved have been done, there will be that interface meeting even before this meeting be, 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 between the uh, researchers and the farmers and medicines that are told, so that if, if they are to uh, iron out some questions that can be done outside because uh, this is their area, they have a clinical trial uh, committee, that is the, just a recommendation because uh, once we start administering and um, there are some adverse events as a, uh, a healthy uh, civil society network will not come to you or call to the pharmacy and medicines regulatory authority now to ask them questions because they they, they have that regulatory yeah, means so will be now on their neck or will be commending them uh, for uh, authorizing something this is why i would one, but that is not coming to you, it, it is going to the Ministry of Health. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, maybe just to clarify the fears of our colleagues from civil society, maybe there could be others who are online. Uh, the Ministry of Health through the Department of HIV works closely with the, our regulator authority for any new drugs that we are incorporating in our treatment regimen. Um, I think you very well know that uh, um, the HIV space is a very dynamic space. We usually have, uh, we, 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 I think the scientists are working day and night to come up with better ARVs um, that are safe, that have fewer side effects. And uh, whenever there's a new drug on the market, which has been pre-qualified by WHO, uh, and we have, and, we, and the science has proven that uh, uh, it's a drug that we can uh, use in Malawi and even adopt, or even put in our guidelines, uh, we work through the regulatory authority to have the drug registered. 
uh, uh, for the different people use, use, uses or for the purpose that we want to use it. And uh, all the processes follow the protocols that have been set by the regulatory authority. For these particular drugs, uh, I mentioned earlier on that there was an initial study that was done and that was the point that they were adopted. And again, we worked through the same regulatory authority. But also the regulatory authority, they are part of, I think there's a committee that oversees trials. So they are already part and parcel of the, uh, uh, the systems uh, in terms of uh, reviewing the protocols where we have clinical trials, but also at the point of uh, uh, registering the drugs for use. But I'd also want to mention that uh, as, a, as a department of HIV, we, have, we are also working with them in terms of pharmacovigilance. So all facilities where most of our drugs are being used, uh, there's a process of pharmacovigilance where the service providers, whenever they identify uh, um, um, side effects that, are not, that were not initially registered, or even those that are registered, uh, they complete a form which is submitted immediately to uh, uh, the, regulatory, the regulatory body. And now we are even moving to a step where by uh, the reporting will be done uh, through a digital system so that the information readily reaches them and they can take action together with us. Thank you. Yeah, good morning once again. Uh, I think uh, uh, we are not uh, doing well in terms of uh, time. Yeah, now uh, before I hand over to uh, Dr. Zinkambani to uh, take back the program, yeah, we have a few areas as a department that uh, uh, we may need uh, some clarifications. Yeah, we noted that uh, in this study, uh, pregnant women, breastfeeding women, they were excluded. And then uh, uh, people that are less than 18 years, they're also not uh, eligible. But now when we are making a policy, definitely it's usually inclusive. Yeah, we have to include uh, all the population groups. Yeah, so uh, those are some of the areas that uh, we need uh, clarification. Yeah, on the other hand, uh, as a department, we are also worried that uh, we have heard that uh, the majority of the patients were ART experienced. So uh, that uh, worries us as a department. Either we are not doing good screening uh, at the time that uh, we are enrolling these people into ART. Yeah, otherwise, uh, these patients, they were supposed to be caught uh, as at that time and then uh, treated before they get the actual the meningitis because we have uh, the preemptive therapy for those people that have a uh, cryptococcemia. Yeah, and then uh, we, also, uh, don't, we also don't have answers on patients uh, that have uh, some conditions that might affect the clearance of the fungus from the CSF. For example, patients with uh, diabetes, yeah, we also don't have information on uh, patients that will be taking this recommended regimen alongside the uh, ARVs that either affect the kidney functions, for example, a uh, tenofovir, or uh, maybe a uh, streptomycin or any other uh, TB medicines that also affect uh, the kidney functions. So uh, those are some of the areas that uh, definitely uh, we need the uh, answers before we can uh, clearly formulate the policy. Yeah, but otherwise, uh, as ministry, we have welcomed uh, these findings and we'll do the need for. Yeah, over to you, Dr. Zinkamba. Thank you. All right, so at, the, at this point, uh, I have to make a few announcements before I call upon the guest of honor to officially close uh, the meeting. Uh, we are going to have a group photo at the end. And then we have refreshments. And there's a team sitting on the back there. We have uh, uh, Evren, uh, who will be responsible for logistics. Yeah, so everyone coming from the Minister of Health and other institutions other than UNC and MOW, they can pass by that table to get their fuel refunds. Those attending online, I think you are sorted. Yeah, so uh, thank you very much uh, for coming. Uh, so one of the next steps uh, from the knowledge translation platform 
uh, we will be to work with the uh, researchers and the Department of HIV and AIDS uh, to come up with a poster brief that will be used. And uh, to do to be able to do that, we need uh, the results on uh, cost effectiveness, yeah, because uh, the decision makers they will need they really need to know how much uh, they are going to spend uh, to introduce a new uh, new treatment uh, protocol. Uh, so uh, I hope the results will be out very soon, and then that will form the first brief. Yeah, so at this point, let me call upon Dr. Mali, who's the, uh, the director of uh, clinical services and uh, is also representing the Center for Health to official confirmation. Okay. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Zinkambani. Um, let me just say, all colleagues, good afternoon. Is it afternoon or still morning? Good morning, good morning, good morning. Yeah, good morning. Um, in the clinical domain, our primary interest is uh, better patient outcomes. And uh, from uh, what has been presented here, um, it points towards uh, that uh, particular direction. Um, there is a general consensus that uh, we should be moving towards the direction of uh, uh, revisiting our uh, treatment guidelines in so far as management of cryptococcal meningitis is concerned. Uh, from what has transpired here, uh, we do not hear any serious uh, reservations uh, for us not to move in that particular direction. But I must say that uh, for us to move uh, in a systematic way and uh, so that whatever comes at the end of the day has got um, um, national ownership, we have to work with uh, existing structures. And uh, we have uh, in this country the National Medicines uh, Committee. Earlier on, I mentioned that this is a committee uh, which is chaired by uh, Dr. Chimota Wachimota Peel for a long time. This uh, committee was very, very dominant and we revamped it. And uh, it's actually the one that's uh, working on uh, uh, revisiting or reviewing the fifth edition of the Malawi uh, Standard Treatment Guidelines. And therefore, I know there are quite a number of programs, TB, malaria, uh, HIV, and so on and so forth, uh, that based on um, um, evidence um, would like to review or revisit uh, the treatment guidelines. And the case in point is the reason we are here uh, to look at the evidence that has come forth in so far as management of our cryptococcal meningitis is concerned. And therefore, I want to impress upon everybody uh, that uh, moving forward, yes, I know there are all these technical working groups, uh, those should continue meeting, but the admit authority in terms of um, uh, reviewing, uh, updating or vetting national treatment guidelines, uh, the, that authority rests with uh, the National Medicines Committee and the leadership is um, uh, in the hands of um, uh, Dr. Chimota Wachimota Piri. So I want to indicate that moving forward, let's closely work uh, with uh, that uh, structure. I know it's a back and forth process because as we go along, there will be other things coming up. Uh, there are issues to do with uh, the cost effectiveness. Uh, of course, that information is uh, very, very helpful uh, so that uh, we move uh, in a particular direction uh, as a nation. But as I said, um, in the clinical domain, our major interest is better patient outcomes and uh, nothing short of that. On behalf of uh, the Secretary for Health, uh, I would like to thank uh, all of you for sparing your time to participate uh, in this uh, uh, meeting. We know there are so many things, competing uh, things um, uh, on your desks, but you, you found it uh, wise to spare this time so that uh, together uh, we find a common ground for moving forward. And I know since we're talking about HIV, we're talking about cryptococcal meningitis, uh, the directorate that is going to push the agenda so that uh, eventually uh, we uh, change the um, treatment guidelines, it will be my colleague director HIV there. So I've taken you uh, through the steps uh, that we have to follow moving forward. 
And uh, let me thank you once again. And on behalf of the SH, it is my pleasure to declare this uh, meeting officially closed. Thank you so much, colleagues. Uh, thank you, the guest of honor. So now the steps are clear. Once the person brief uh, is complete, we know where to present the person brief. There's a committee uh, that has been mentioned here. So, uh, Elias, you opened with a word of prayer. And uh, uh, could you, can you please close with a prayer? Sir? Let us play in closing. Lord, gracious Father, we thank you for being with us when we had our discussions. Uh, we, some of us had questions, we're glad they've been answered. Some of us didn't know what was going on, but we're all aware and we're thankful that out of the discussions we had, the tangible steps moving forward, we ask you, Lord, to guide everything that will be taken up from this meeting, from the discussions, so that we have uh, what we need, uh, a change in our current practice and policy, and then to enable us achieve our goal of uh, better patient care and a better health for Malawi. We are grateful for this afternoon. Guide us as we go back to our respective places and homes. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. So for those uh, present physically, let's have a group photo outside. Uh, we're going to pour every in, and then afterwards, we'll have the refreshments here and networking. Thank you. Uh, for those present online, this is the end of the meeting. Thank you for being available. Join us next time as you'll be conducting our scientific meetings. Again, after the refreshments, for those of you who can remain behind, there'll be lunch as well. Jumble on your phone.